Today, I'm gonna to make a Belgian dark strong ale mash and then distill it to see if it will make a tasty whiskey. How's it going, Chasers? I hope you're having a kick-ass week. I'm Jesse, this is Still It, and today we're going to see if we can borrow a few things from the beer brewing world uh, and see if they'll carry over into a distilled spirit. Today I'm going to be making a Belgian dark strong ale mash recipe. It's going to be pretty similar to what you would do if you were making a beer. I'm going to change things around a little bit, no boil, no hops to suit the whiskey world, but the heart of it, the heart of it, the soul of it, is still gonna be a Belgian strong ale. Why did I pick a Belgian dark strong? Well, I think it has an interesting mix up of grain and specialty grain flavors paired with Belgian candy sugar and a very different yeast than we would normally use. So the first thing I need to do is find a recipe. Now, this video is sponsored by Grainfather. So I'm gonna be using their equipment and ecosystem, I guess, to make it happen. But of course, you can use whatever you want. The first thing I need to do, though, is find a recipe for inspiration, a Belgian dark strong recipe. And to do that, I am going to use the Grainfather app because it has a whole bunch of recipes that you can access, download, edit, and brew with. It's heavily focused on beer, but for this video, obviously, it makes sense. There is a buttload of Belgian quadruple, Belgian dark strong recipes on the app, uh, but this one caught my eye because it uses oats and wheat, which I'll give it to you, beer snobs, beer nerds, is a little bit controversial for a Belgian quad. There are very good examples out there that are at the very least similar to the style that use it. And I think it's gonna be really beneficial in the distilling process. So I'm gonna pick this recipe, uh, download it, and I'm gonna edit it to suit our needs for distillation. Uh, and this is what I've ended up with. If you're interested in the app, there's a link in the description to download it. The plan for this is to fill this guy here, which is a Badmo barrel up with this spirit to age. It's not just any Badmo barrel. It's kind of a special one, I'll talk about that a little bit later on. But to do that, I figure I need around about 150 liters of wash, so I've got a little bit of extra spirit to play around with, and to do that with this recipe, I'm gonna have to triple it. So I end up with this full list of ingredients. By the way, team, all of this stuff will be written down in the description, so if you wanna go down there and get the recipe, feel free to do so. Also, this recipe should scale really well, so if you wanna double it or triple it or halve it or whatever you wanna do, just do the math and it should work out just fine. So, let's mash in. I have a Grainfather G40 with 32 liters of strike water heated up and ready to go. Six kilos of Pilsner malt goes in, along with a third of the total uh, specialty malts and adjuncts, mashing in relatively slowly, making sure we're not getting dough balls, all of that good stuff. Stuff. Uh, and we're settling at 65 degrees Celsius for our mash temp. The Grainfather G40 and G70 actually have three different ways that you can control a mash, which is pretty cool. You can do it manually, just set a temperature directly on the unit itself. You can use the app to control it wirelessly, manually, to set a temperature that you want or you can push the recipe that you build in the app over to the unit and it'll actually give you prompts all the way through the mashing process. It'll remind you to heat up your strike water. It'll tell you that your mash has finished and then automatically start raising it up for mash out temperature. Uh, that's pretty cool. I did one of each just to see how it worked and they all worked well. While that's going, we need to make Belgian candy sugar, and that's gonna take a while. So let's crack on with that while we're waiting for our mash to mash for an hour. Now you can't just go out and buy the stuff that's cool. I thought it was kind of expensive for what it was, so we're gonna make our own. You're gonna need a pot, a very large pot. I'm making six kilos of actual sugar here. Uh, I used a 10 liter pot, and it wasn't really big enough. <laughs> You're also going to need a hot plate. Into that pot, add six kilograms of sugar and two liters of the wash out of your mash tun. You could just use all water here, but apparently, and this makes sense to me, the proteins, sugars, all the other weird stuff in the wash is gonna add complexity and depth of flavor later on. Uh, and another two liters of water to get you up to four liters in total. Keep stirring it, don't turn the element on yet. You want it fully dissolved before you turn the heat on. Uh, keep stirring it until it's fully dissolved. You may need to add 
up to another liter of water just to get it fully dissolved. Then you can get the heat on, get it up to a boil, and add in 150 mils of lemon juice. This is gonna help us invert the sugar. I've talked about that in past videos. Not 100% necessary, eh, but I figured why not, let's do it. Try not to stir the solution too much at all. You really don't need to. Uh, as water slowly boils off, the temperature of the candy that we're making is slowly gonna rise. So make sure you've got a way of measuring the temperature in the pot. Uh, a candy thermometer is wonderful. I'm just using a meat probe that is uh, somewhat water resistant. Keep on bubbling away until the temperature rises up to around about 260 degrees Fahrenheit, which is this in Celsius. I'm working backwards, I know. Strange, this is the recipe I found. <laughs> At that point, let it go for another half an hour. If the temperature starts to rise up over around about 285 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, add a little bit of water, just small splashes of water in to keep the temperature down. Once you've held it at that temperature for around about half an hour, we're gonna add in some baking soda. The idea here is that we're gonna change it from an acidic solution to help the inversion process to a basic solution, which is gonna help the Maillard forming process. I would suggest taking it off the heat for this uh, and letting it sit for a little while because uh, acid plus base releases gas, and we don't wanna boil over. To be honest, I kind of did this to taste. I'd add a little bit of the baking soda and water solution in, stir it all up, take a little teaspoon out, cool it down in cold water, and taste it until I could taste that it's shifted to being a basic solution instead of an acidic solution, uh, but wasn't, you know, just tasting like baking soda. Get it back on the heat, we're gonna do the same thing. Keep evaporating out water, let the temperature of the solution rise, uh, and you wanna hold this at around about 150 degrees Celsius, 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Don't let it get hotter than that, because we'll start burning it. Uh, and now we're just developing flavor and color. How far you take that is entirely up to you. If you go on the lighter, shorter side of things, you're gonna get more kind of dark, plum, raisin, caramely, kind of flavors. If you go a little bit longer, you'll start getting, you'll still retain some of those flavors, but you'll start pushing a darker caramel even a little bit longer. Almost, almost burnt caramel heading towards coffee. Then you'll start hitting coffee and chocolate. Uh, if you go much past that, it won't be very nice. I decided to settle for a point where I was getting a lot of the fruity characteristics, the dark caramel characteristics, and a little bit of chocolate but nowhere near coffee. I didn't want a coffee flavor in this. Once you've got the flavor you want, take it off the heat, add about another liter of water back into it. We don't want it crystallizing, we want it as a syrup. Uh, and this actually took quite some time. So let me take you back over to the mash tun and I'll show you what I was doing there at the same time. After one hour of mashing, it's time to get the liquid out of the mash tun and into our fermenter. So I bumped the temperature up to 70 degrees Celsius for mash out pumped the liquid over into the fermenter, and I already had 30 odd liters of sparge water heated up and ready to go. Uh, I will quite often use the T500 pot uh, as a hot liquor tank, because it's easy and convenient to slap on the bench, fill up, and turn on to heat the water up. All of that water goes into the mash tun again, give it a good stir, let it sit for a minute or two, and pump that into the fermenter as well. I'll generally measure the runnings coming out of the mash tun and keep sparging until I get down to around about 10, 20, 10, 15, somewhere around there. That is a one mash completed, so all I need to do now is duplicate that exact process two more times to get through all of my grain. Once all three of the mashes are completed and all of the liquid is in the fermenter, I'm sitting just under 150 liters. Uh, the Belgian candy sugar can go in there as well and be stirred up. So my total volume is, if I had to guess, this isn't graduated, right around 145 liters. Uh, and the original gravity is 1065. With a longer triple mash day like this, it doesn't take a whole lot longer to let the uh, mash tun cool down to pitching temperature, which for me is 25 degrees Celsius. And I'll be using Mangrove Jack's M41 yeast to try and uh, crowbar in some of those interesting fruity, banana-y, spicy flavors of a Belgian quad. I used five packets in total, and yes, I know 25 degrees is hot for this, but we're trying to push it a little bit harder. 
uh, bump up the esters so we guarantee that they follow over, carry over in distillation. This one took about eight days to ferment out dry down to 1.00. I let it sit for another six days to sour. This one took a little bit longer than normally. Normally I aim for uh, two or three days. Uh, I didn't get any sign of uh, palicle or anything like that. Uh, but I did get a perceptive uh, shift in the acidity of the wort. And for those of you that don't know, if you're coming from the brewing side, a little bit of acid, lactic acid or whatever else is produced, uh, is a great precursor for esters that'll add extra flavor, often around kind of the fruity side of things, when you distill it. Speaking of distillation, it's finally time to get stuck into the fun stuff. I'm not personally attacking you brewers, but this is also uh, the main thing that Grandfather wanted me to show you. They're now selling a converter lid that goes on top of your G40 or G70, uh, a whiskey helmet or an onion, whatever you want to call it, and a converter kit that'll convert uh, from here back to the Still Spirits condensers, which means that you can use your G40 for distillation uh, combined with, they've teamed up with Still Spirits to use their copper uh, condenser or the T500 reflux condenser as well, which is pretty freaking cool. You can head to grandfather.com for more information or to purchase their equipment. So let's get stuck into the stripping runs. For those of you that don't know, the goal, the point of a stripping run uh, is not to select flavors, it's not to make cuts, it's just literally to cut down on volume as quickly as we can. Uh, so let's take about 42, 45 liters out of the fermenter, put it into the G40. I know we have some head space, but what we don't want is to create a whole lot of bubbles and boil over, distillers often call this a puke, uh, a little knob of butter going in the top can help change the surface tension and protect us against that as well. I'm gonna fire the G40 up to 100% power and yes, thank you, grandfather. We can control power manually. We don't have to do it with the PID and temperatures and stuff like that. Whack it up to 100%, uh, get it heated up as quick as we can. When we get close to the point where the liquid's going to start boiling, I'll bump the temperature back down to about 70%. Uh, once again, just to protect against boil overs. Get the water running through the condenser and start collecting out of the end. Once it's been running for about 10 minutes, I'll pop it back up to 100% just using the manual control on the unit itself. Uh, and we're gonna collect all the way down to around about five, 10% dripping out of the end of the still. I gotta say that when I first started talking to Grandfather about this, I was a little concerned that this condenser wouldn't have enough knockdown power to deal with the G40 on 100%. Uh, I'm pleased to say I was 100% wrong. It did fine. Collect everything that came out of the still. We're gonna call these low wines from the beginning of the run, all the way down to five, 10% dripping off the end of the nozzle. Uh, and we're gonna just keep repeating this process until our fermenter is empty. For me, that was three runs. Once you're finished with the stripping runs, empty the still out one last time, put all of the low wines back in. Uh, and I had reserved about five or six liters from the fermenter that didn't fit into my last stripping run. So I put that in as well. Now we're ready for our spirit run. And this time we definitely are making cuts. So I manually set it to 100% power again, got it warmed up nice and quick. When it started getting close to producing, uh, I dropped the power down even a little bit more than last time. I just wanted to see uh, how much power I needed to get the speed of offtake I was looking for. If you guys haven't done this before, I would thoroughly suggest running a pot still, not based on the temperature at the top of the column or near the top of the condenser, instead run it on offtake speed. Just keep in mind that throughout the course of the run, as the temperature, the boiling temperature of the liquid raises, you're gonna need to bump the power up every now and again to retain that offtake speed. I reserved around about 400 mils as four shots, put those into the fire lighter bottle uh, and started collecting heads into individual jars. It turned out that I needed to take around about two and a half liters. I would thoroughly suggest making this cut based on your nose, your taste buds and touch. For me, heads initially are gonna be a weird like fake fruity florally sort of scent. You don't want that. After that, it's gonna clean up and almost be like vodka. It's a trap, it's not clean yet, don't take those either. After that, it's gonna move into a phase where it starts to get a little bit astringent, slightly bitter. Uh, it's almost the smell of changing the inner tube on a bicycle. Some people describe it as 
um, like infant milky baby spew up. When that cleans up and you start actually tasting the flavors from the grain, that's when you can switch to hearts. Once into hearts, I collect it into a larger vessel just to save switching jars out all the time uh, and carried on distilling all the way down until I reached about 60% ABV where I thought I was starting to detect tails. Tails are going to present kind of like wet cardboard heading towards wet dog. They're start, starting to go from uh, cereally grainy wheat bixy kind of taste through to a funky old off grain flavor, and that's where you want to switch over to tails. For me, I made the cut at 59% ABV. That'll give you some indication of where you're wanting to switch. After making all the cuts, I've got all of the hearts I've decided to keep reserved in here, uh, and I'm going to proof this down to 60% ABV. Now, the ABV you select to age on wood at is going to change the flavors you're looking to get out of the wood. If you go on the lower side, perhaps 55% ABV, it's going to be more on the barrel candy, sweet, vanilla side of things. If you go on the high side of things, perhaps 65% ABV, eh, you're looking more at kind of pulling out the baking spice, a little bit more astringent kind of peppery characters out of the wood. I'm going to go about in the middle and aim for 60% ABV. Uh, I'm being lazy today and I'm just putting an alchemeter in the pot uh, and I'm just going to keep adding water to it until it reads right around 60% ABV. This isn't a great way to do it, guys, because uh, as you add water in here, the temperature of the liquid is going to actually heat up, and that'll, you know, throw your reading off a little bit. Like I said, I'm being lazy. <laughs> so I have uh, screwed up and overshot slightly. That's why you don't do it this way. You should. Take a reading of the ABV, measure out the volume, put it into a calculator, there's one on chasethecraft.com, uh, and then, you know, add a known volume of water into this. Uh, like I said, I'm being lazy, I'm, I'm fine with like 58% ABV for this one. So why is this barrel uh, special? It's special because it is the first barrel that Christopher made when he took over the reins uh, from Ben at Badmo Barrels. Uh, it's also special because this is made with 10 year old, 10 years, it's season four, Oregon oak. I don't know of anyone else using this stuff. It's pretty much specific just to bad my barrels at the, at the moment. I have yet to really experiment with it and try it. Uh, but from what Christopher's telling me, he says it kind of slots in between US white oak and French oak. So, if you think it, so if you think of US white oak, go a little bit more barrel spicy, a little bit more kind of molassesy on the sweet side instead of uh, vanillary on the US white oak side. So I'm thinking this spirit and this wood should complement each other quite nicely. So if you are interested in one of these Badmo barrels, they're very, very cool. They solve a lot of problems for home distillers. Uh, and if you're in America, I'll put a link down below to Badmo site. You can buy them direct uh, from Bad Motivated Legacy Barrels. Uh, or if you're in Australia or New Zealand, I'll put a link uh, to our website where you can buy them here. All right, barrels all filled. Stave goes in. Stave, bung. Bung goes in. Little love tap to set it. Uh, and last time I made a video, with one of these barrels, someone suggested that instead of sticking water on top, uh, why not just sacrifice a tiny amount of the alcohol, like this, to protect the alcohol that's in there uh, and help the barrel swell. So that's why I've been not too stressed about um, leaking a little bit on top of the barrel. All right, let's get stuck into tasting this. I'm going to steal a little out of there in my Glen Ken glass. Uh, but first, actually, a huge thank you to the Patreons. Thank you so much, Patreons, for being the people that support us day in, day out. Uh, we thoroughly freaking appreciate it. Thank you so much, team. Let me just say that at least this proves to me that your selection in ingredients and yeast 100% matters. It totally changes the final product. I, I mean, it just seems obvious to me that it would, <laughs> but um, there are people out there that say that it doesn't matter at all, you're basically making vodka, uh, you're just sticking it into a barrel and all the flavor comes from the barrel. I, I disagree, humbly. So, 
What are we getting here? First of all, we're getting a very interesting complex um, malt base. Pilsner malt presents slightly different than an ale malt, uh, as like a standard six row, or even something like a Golden Promise if you're going that way. But more interestingly, uh, the wheat and the oats, like you can smell them. There wasn't a lot in there, but I feel like they make it slightly more cereally, which is quite interesting. There's also definitely some interesting fruit going on. Not like straight up banana from the yeast, uh, but I think, I think it's an amalgamation between some of the specialty malts, the yeast selection we used, and the Belgian candy syrup. They're all kind of lending to this interesting, sweet, um, borderline caramel, like ducking into kind of pear and orchard fruit, but also plum kind of notes. Raisins, not raisins. Figs, not figs. Date, date as well, date and plum. Uh, so the nose is pretty pleasant. I have cut it slightly grungy at this point in time because I want to age this for probably like two years. So it's got plenty of time to clean up. The palate is super, super creamy and silky already. And I'm going to attribute that to the wheat somewhat, uh, mostly to the oats. So a little bit of oats goes a long way, man. Very, very similar on the palate to what I just described. Uh, the one additional thing that I wasn't picking up on the nose is that Belgian yeast spiciness. It's not straight up clove in this one. It's close to it. A little bit of black pepper, a little bit of clove, a little bit of just kind of all the baking spices slapped in together. Uh, and like I said before, I think that's going to play really nicely with that wood. Uh, I still have around about a litre of spirit sitting in here that I'm gonna stick into glass and I would like your suggestions on what you would like me to age it with. Uh, I could age it on US white oak staves to compare to the Gariana oak. I could put Gariana oak staves into the glass as well to compare between the barrel uh, and the staves. I could do something totally different. Uh, you guys tell me, what do you wanna see me do? So a huge thank you to uh, Grainfather for sponsoring this video. Uh, if you have any questions about their equipment, uh, there is a link down below that explains everything. Go there, check it out. And a huge thank you to Badmo Barrels for sending me the barrel. Uh, once again, there's links to our website and their website if you want to pick up one of those. So have a kick-ass week, guys. I will see you next time. See ya.